the Two Guys One Shaker Cup Podcast, hosted by Joshua Shaw and Ryan Buckeye. Cluck, cluck, Josh Shaw. <laughs> yes, I got on the laugh before five seconds. And happy Thanksgiving if you're listening uh, on Turkey Day, as it's the uh, the start of the Turkey Five, right? Is that what you called it? Like, is that what it's supposed to be called? Yeah, it's a Turkey Five. That's that's an Amazon Amazonian, I guess, uh, word there, jargon word. Jargon word. Well, jargon. We're back with uh, another podcast here on a holiday, and uh, I, I have no idea if people are listening to this with their families or if they listened to the government and decided that they weren't allowed to see their family. I don't know. I'm not trying to get political here, but Jesus Christ, Josh, what are we doing? Um, happy Thanksgiving, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Also, the one person that's probably winning in all this is probably the turkeys that aren't getting killed that, <laughs> yeah. today, this year. I mean, what I don't even know if they have a longer life cycle now or not, but like there's a lot of turkeys that are going to be able to be able to run free or maybe just live a second year. I don't know because a lot of people are not eating turkey today, which is a travesty. It's terrible. I don't understand how somebody would not want to still want to eat their turkey dinner. That's one of my favorite dinners uh, each year. You hear that, Josh? You, now you're putting the whole office in danger. Turkeys. They're going to take over the world. They're going to take over the world. Uh, but for real, in all seriousness, yeah, kind of a crazy, crazy year. But, um, you know, obviously, as we reflect on this year, a lot of people are probably like, I don't have a whole lot to be thankful for. I mean, I, I disagree. I, have a, I yeah. personally have a ton to be thankful for. I know you as well, a ton to be thankful for. And what we want to do is kind of just like a fun hypothetical, like who, who's your ideal um, you know, dinner party for Thanksgiving? Who would you, let, who would you want to invite? Um, and uh, if you say my mother, Josh Hall, I'm going to reach through the screen, grab you by that ear of yours, take you to Kent State, and beat you down worse than the Badgers beat you down two years ago. So, Josh Shaw, uh, I'm excited about this one. I'm excited to see who you have because you probably have, like, a table full of just, like, people who wrote, like, 20 books and just, like, thought leaders. And then here's me over here, like, I want The Rock. I want, you know, I'm, I'm a fanboy over here. <laughs> Yeah, I think people are going to be easily understand the divide here where like most of my people are going to be on the business side of things because that's what I if I'm going to have a, a nice dinner uh, and I'm going to have some conversation, I probably want to talk some complex business things. So I'm going to go in that direction. So just to kind of name a, one that is pretty obvious is, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos. I think the the king of all business would be pretty interesting to learn from. I think just his mind, the way that he thinks, this the way that he is going after these big, complex industries. It's like every single week, Amazon decides to jump into another like, you know, 10 or $100 billion industry. And it's like, how do you constantly reach for more when you're already so huge? Like a lot of us, we're never going to reach the, the pinnacle of our space. Um, and he's at that pinnacle, but yet he's seems to be relentlessly going after the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it's like, just, just to be able to understand like why and how he's wired and like maybe some little tidbits you could pick up would be to me like invaluable just because it's just insane. The, the amount of stuff that he gets his hands into, it, it seems on a week to week basis. Maybe this isn't appropriate, but do you think you'd learn more by inviting Jeff Bezos to Thanksgiving dinner or Jeff Bezos ex wife about Jeff Bezos? <laughs> To Thanksgiving dinner, because I feel I feel like the ex-wife would probably be more forthcoming of information for you, Josh, uh, and you'd actually learn some more personal stuff about the man in which you admire at your dinner table. But no, I, I, on a serious note, I mean, you really can't. I mean, the guy's worth like twenty trillion dollars, and obviously he's wired. And and you know, I love what I love, and I know people have seen the photo, but that photo of Jeff Bezos in the, like the first Amazon office. I'm sure you've seen it with like yeah. a piece of plywood on the wall. I think there's Amazon spray paint on it. Like for the longest time. I'm like that shit's got to be fake, um, but it's you know I I, I I would you know like you for instance like when you first started I I guarantee you didn't have that beautiful luxurious grass behind you in your office you you probably had a PC and maybe it's a still a PC I don't know if you have a Mac or not but like you know we all start somewhere and I think his story um, would be would be extraordinary to hear and to listen to and how did you start this e-commerce platform that basically took over the world and changed the way we shopped I mean that is. He is solely responsible for changing one of the biggest consumer behaviors in history. You know, I mean, like, we used to have to get into a car, drive to a gas station, <laughs> light a cigarette, put the cigarette out, and then walk into a store that didn't have automatic <laughs> doors. You had to physically push open the doors. 
Don't even get me started when you walked into the bathroom. You actually had to flush the toilets. I mean, that's the world that we used to live in. And now it's super, super easy as, as people are probably flocking to Amazon.com um, today to do, to do things. Um, for, I love that one. I think it's great. I think like we actually talked about his name or said his name on a, a recent podcast with Mark Samuel. But Richard Branson, I think, is just like an extraordinary story, too. Like this guy, um, you know, if anybody knows anything about his, his youth, like he wasn't – like a lot of self-made entrepreneurs, I mean, he just made his wealth. And I think a lot of times people forget where people come from and they just assume people are rich and then they, they change their perception of people. Like when they become a certain status in life, now they're just an ignorant rich old man or rich woman. Like that's not fair. I mean, there there's – I'm sure there's just so much – and he's gotten books and there's a bunch of articles on him. But I mean just to – Sit and, like you said, just be a sponge and just absorb knowledge from somebody who's accomplished a lot in the business world. And I think maybe that's why you and I, our first people, were both business related people because that's what we are. We're, we're, we're wired that way. And I, I don't, you can read as many books as you want, listen to audiobooks, whatever. But I think that personal face to face contact, con, contact over a nice cold glass of beer, maybe some turkey and some mashed potatoes, you're going to learn a lot about somebody um, and their success stories. And I think the biggest thing is not just listening, but then applying some of the stuff that you have just heard from that individual. Um, Because I I guarantee, I mean, you and I would probably be out with our notebooks, just like jotting things down. I mean, just with with little nuggets of information on how they – it's not even so much like what strategies did they implement and, and what decisions did they make. It's like why did they make those decisions and why did they do the things that they did from a personal level? Because I think, you know, to what Mark said in the previous podcast, there are certain people cut a certain way. Um, and obviously those two, and, and I think you and I are, are in that same, like we're in the same boat as those two. You know, granted, we're, we're worth a lot less. But like in terms of like how we were born and cut, I, I feel that we're all very similar. Yeah, I think both of those names – are of more of like the self-made side of things. And then I, Richard Branson, which I like, is that he really approaches um, like day-to-day activities in a different way. Like how do you make it a better experience? And I think mm-hmm. you see that with a lot of entrepreneurs where they're trying to look at an experience that we've accepted as like, this is just how it always is. And we don't think it can get any better. And then he comes on and says, oh, I can make this better. There's a lot of friction. There's a lot of things that Maybe I don't like, and he makes it better. And and that's interesting from somebody of his stature because you tend to be like, you know, you don't know what's going on. You're, you're so away from like what's day to day of like what humans are like struggling with because you have the money to just gloss over that. Um, and I find that to be, you know, kind of really interesting for him. If we're on the trend of self-made, um, my next person that I think I'd have there, and this is going to be a business person, but didn't start more on that business side. I'm going to have Kanye West. So a lot of people Time are, out. Time out. Yeah. Do you speak a foreign language, Josh? Yeah. So if he, that's a very polarizing person. Um, I'm on the side that I find him extremely fascinating. I think of him as one of the most um, kind of disrespected geniuses of our time um, because of just the way that he's able to think about things in his own way. And he is extremely confident in himself. He's extremely um, kind of like, let's say a generalist. Um, He's very good at a lot of things. He's been able to master a lot of things that people have said that you're never going to be able to do. You know, him kind of making beats in a basement and working extremely hard, harder than probably anybody in that space for a long period of time. They said he couldn't rap. Then he finally gets to be able to rap and he ends up becoming you know the top of that game and then he wanted to go and learn fashion designing and things like that and everybody in the fashion world was like you can't do this you're not going to be able to do this he ends up you know going over to paris and things like that learning and, and taking internships doing all that he becomes great at that then you know he's smart enough to make a really unique deal with adidas for his yeezy brand that now has him at i think about a three billion dollar um net worth or something like that and it's like Every single time when people tell him he can't do something, he ends up doing it, which I think is one of those things that if you could be around and and just kind of hear somebody like that talk and and just be able to present ideas in a way that is different than what you're hearing from news organizations, different content create, like he's somebody that you're going to get very unique ideas from and it's going to inspire the hell out of you. I, I think, I mean, I think people probably fold him into these personalities like a like a Trump where like you don't like a certain part of the personality so you just choose not to like that person over 
there's a lot of really great things that him as just a, a great kind of genius mind that you could take and just be inspired a ton from. I don't know. I mean, it's I always when people talk about Kanye West and I start to talk very positively about him, it always takes people back because they're like they had a different thought of him or they just kind of took one subset that they learned from maybe from the Kardashian or something. They're like, oh, I don't like him because of this or he's crazy or whatever it is. Most of the genius people in the world are, are crazy. I mean, I think there's a fine line between that. And for you to take the craziness away, I think takes away the genius of somebody. You should also have Joe Rogan there to translate for you since he couldn't figure out how to do that podcast with Kanye either. Um, I am um, – this might be unpopular for some of our listening audience, and I don't care, but I would love, love – and I did not vote this way, Josh, but I would love to have Kamala Harris at my, at my table only because – Breaking through barriers and doing something as monumental as, as what happened – I mean if you choose to believe the results of the election, I guess I should preface by saying that. <laughs> Regardless of if you vote left or right, having a female in the presidential office in a, in a VP role, a, a, a lady of color, somebody you know, that's, that's not like your traditional wasp, I think is absolutely remarkable. And it, it couldn't have been easy, and she – I mean, she had a fight to get to where she was, and you could, again, you, people can say whatever they want on, on how they think she got to where she did. She got to where she is. She's there. And that, that to me, is like you can apply that to anything. If, if you're trying to break into a break, – break out something um, that's brand new to the world or break into a new category, you, you can apply personal stories on something like that to any aspect of your life, whether it be business, whatever. And I, I, I do. I think it's like, wow, I mean this – her her mom, I believe, like came here, um, no longer is alive, but like the, her story of her youth and childhood, and then growing up, becoming uh, what the the attorney general of California, or and then just now being the VP. I, I think it's a really remarkable story that, regardless of Republican or Democrat, you can sit there and listen to it. And I would think, if you're an open minded individual, you would find something from conversation with her that you could appreciate and apply um, in a significant way into which how you carry yourself. To piggyback what you said about maybe not being popular, I think when somebody is trying to discount, you know, first female vice president, or taking this a couple layers down, where there was, I think, the first transgender um, Congress uh, person. Um, so there's these things where they're like they don't want those things to happen, and it's for whatever it is, like fear, um, previous misconceptions, um, they're conditioned to believe a certain thing, whatever it is. I kind of think of it the other way. I think we need to have equal voices mm -hmm. in these powerful positions. Now, just because there's one person out of hundreds, does that mean that the world's gonna change just because that person is there? No, but we as maybe straight white males have no idea what that person is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And because of that, we have blind spots. And the blind spots is what creates systematic things over long periods of time. So just having that one voice maybe opens up a little bit of people's eyes and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then over time, we start to get the right voices in there and the right kind of percentages that make sense for the American people. Because you know, regardless of you and I are, are white males, um, I don't think that we are going to keep our reign for forever. I think that there, there is a – we shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, I mean I think that – I think the people that are um, you know, honest with themselves enough know that that's not right. right. It's that we need to have more of those voices in there. And people can talk about you know, how they believe this, that, or whatever. You didn't live in their shoes. You don't know what they go on. And, and that's part of the problem <laughs> that we're talking about here is that you know, a lot of that ends up just getting to a place of like they go to disrespect or they try to knock it down because – Maybe it's um, you know an image of them that they they couldn't fulfill themselves, and maybe that that upsets them that they didn't get to that level or or whatever it is, and they want to try to discount people. So I know when you made that post originally, I think it was around like your daughter seeing like those inspirations at like the highest level of being able to look and say I can achieve anything, and I think that that's we need more of that in any kind of subsection of the economy or the consumers or human beings. Um, I always talk in business terms, so excuse, excuse me for that. But just overall, I think people need to see those representations of what they look like and know that I can get to those highest levels possible. So I like it, even though it's, you know, like you said, I mean, it, people are, are going to maybe hate on that choice or, or whatever, just because they think about it in a different way. Right. Um, I'm going to name somebody that you're going to be like, who the heck is this guy? Um, 
this, and I might even butcher his name a little bit, but Chamath Palahapatiya. You're like, who the heck is that? Well, what, what's, the, what's the translation for his English name? <laughs> That's his name. Uh, but basically, he was an early Facebook employee. That was kind of where he kind of carved in. He was in, he was in charge of really doing a lot of the things that grew um, Facebook's an, initial kind of user base. That's kind of how he got started. But why I kind of like him is he, again, is like a free thinker, somebody that has bucked a lot of the trends. I think because of the way – that I think he's Sri Lankan and, and the way that he kind of gotten brought up and everything is that he's trying to break down a lot of the walls of like the um, venture capitalist mentality and a lot of way that, in, you know, just businesses are built and things like that. And he's been a champion of what they call these like SPACs. It's like a special purpose acquisition company where basically it helps um, investors like uh, retail investors sometimes even get into deals a little bit earlier. And it's kind of you having a guy at the table to do some deals for you. So he's been able to do, we talked about Richard Branson, and he was the one that brought Virgin Galactic together um, on the public market. So the space um, organization that Richard Branson was a part of and a few other ones that he's been able to do. But what I, I really like him, if you end up anybody you know, kind of digging into his name, if you hear this, is that you'll see a lot of things that he talks about is towards like, the deep things we've we've mentioned around like people not thinking for themselves and social media really getting um, like you know intertwined in your world, you have to really be able to decipher this information and that there's a lot of like systems or or things that are in our lives that are broken and we have to be able to overcome those things and, and a lot of his like social commentary is really unique to that and I like that. Because he's able to also bring those ideas into business at the highest level. And he's a part of these like, you know, multi-billion dollar type of transactions. And I think that's where things start to change because it's always the the money or the private side of things that end up like kind of leaning in forward and, and being able to, to uh, help a lot of things. So I think he's one of those thinkers that's applying what he knows best and then putting it into the context of, of that and hoping that it helps kind of flood through the, the system. And it's just always been interesting the more and more that I tap into him and, and just the way that he is able to kind of communicate really complex ideas is always like it's, it's inspired to me. I think just for all the people I keep mentioning, I like very like complex thinking people, things, people that think differently, people that are reaching for like really large ambitions because those are who I want to learn from. I, I I think those people are very unique in this world. I don't think there's very many of them. And if you can find them and you can have a chance to at least grab a few nuggets of information, it's going to be invaluable. Yeah, I totally agree. I no, I've never heard of this guy. Was he on? Is he part of the Social Dilemma Project at all? Was he involved in that? He was not. No, I mean his his firm, his um, venture capitalist firm is called Social Capital, um, and he's just got a bunch of really unique investments. If anybody ever gets you know, kind of nerdy about it, you'll kind of see very, very instantly. He's had a few like unique conversations at like Harvard and, and things like that, where like he talks in a way that like you would not think somebody like him would talk. And I like that because I think he's just really like straightforward, really like cuts through the bullshit and just tells people like, hey, you got to flip the way you think because the people that are in power are thinking this way and that's the only way to combat it. Yeah, I like that. No, it's cool. I'll definitely check into him. Now you give me homework to do tonight. Um, this is going to seem really odd and awkward maybe um, for people listening, but Lance Armstrong and people are like, why Lance Armstrong did the wrong things and, and eventually was outed and failed essentially. I mean, you could say he was at the highest level of success and then the truth came out about how he got there. And I um, have a, a huge advocate of always doing the right thing and trying to always do the right thing, operating myself with integrity and transparency and I think sometimes we need a reminder of that. And for me, it'd be like to have him at that table and it explain to me why he did what he did and kind of walk through that process and, and maybe learn from some of the mistakes that he made. Because in the business world, sometimes we like to chase the dollar and sometimes people like to take shortcuts to get there. And, and he definitely took shortcuts to get to the top pinnacle of, of what he was doing. So, no, he's not in business per se. But I think – but I think we always, we always focus on the success stories, and sometimes we don't give enough credit to the failures or, or the, the stories of downfalls because I think we can learn just as much, if not more, from those stories as the ones we get from successes. And, I, you know, you could, there's a lot of failures out there. I mean, Elon Musk has failed several times. And, but I think, like, 
to the point where failure was so bad it, it ruined somebody's character. I think like I, I feel like I would take a bunch from that conversation and, and it almost scared the shit out of you to make sure you always are doing the right things per se. But um, you know, there the reasons why they made the choices that they did and, and I don't know. Like it, it's just to me it's it's a fascinating story. I've always been fascinated with the whole Lance Armstrong story. I've watched the Oprah special, I watched the ESPN specials on it and uh, you know, I, I know like what he talks about on camera is one thing, but maybe you could extrapolate some more information from him on a personal level. But I I, I guess my thing here, Josh, is just like trying to learn from somebody who has failed, uh, instead of just always focusing on the success story. Yeah, he reminds me, I think when I was talking about the Kanye West, like, you know, that type of thing where people attach something to him and then throw out all the good or throw out all the fascinating or throw out all the interesting part of somebody. And that's a really good example because, yeah, there are things, uh, you know, he did personally that people would be like, I don't enjoy. I, we're not even talking about the steroid thing because like every single person in that era of that sport was doing it. We're talking more around like the way he treated maybe teammates yep. or, or things like that. As a human being, you're like, I don't know if I respect that. But the stuff that he was doing in terms of like cancer research sure. and stuff like that is literally like unmatched. I mean, he was, could be, uh, you know, the main reason why some of these uh, initiatives have gotten as far as they have in terms of, you know, getting cancer to certain parts of certain different cancers to actually not even be in existence anymore because of how much Livestrong was able to do. And, and for people to forget all about that just because of some other things, I feel like is is terrible. I, I honestly, I, I think, People are complicated, human, you know, all of us. If you think you're just this, you know, pristine person and everybody's perfect, that's where we get into trouble. We put these people on pedestals and we don't realize that they're human beings. Um, we all are imperfect. And the imperfect part of people are, is what's great. I mean, I think everybody we've mentioned that we'd have at our you know, dinner table, all of them are imperfect people. They have these things that we could look at and go, I don't know if I respect that or like that. But I also have a lot of things that I love about this person and, and they're welcome at my table because I know that there's going to be some good things. And that's a kind of a point to just think overall and with think kind of leaning into the good of people, leaning into that part of it, trying not to focus on the bad of somebody that's very easy to do. And I think mm -hmm. that's where society has went to is towards let's focus on the most, you know, wor the worst part of somebody, because that's where you get the clicks. That's where you get the most vile commentary and people get fired up and whatever. But that's not any way to live life. You know what I mean? And I think that that's kind of transition to like some of this, what we're thankful for, you know, with just COVID, I think that is a important point to mention because everybody could have looked at, looked at 2020 and this year and said, it was the worst year ever. Right. And I literally, I did a presentation recently for a client um, where there was like 25 people on the Zoom call. And on the final slide, I was talking about how 2020 should have been your favorite year ever. This should have been your best year ever. And a lot of people looked at me like, what the heck is this guy talking about? Because obviously you have to really just take away some of the the bad part of like, you know, obviously a ton of deaths, ton of things going on. Though You have to be able to um, put your blinders to some of that and realize as a your person, like how have you been able to get better and look at the situation in a better way? And, and that's been for me a unique situation because I have been able to see things that I wouldn't have been able to see if it wasn't for what happened this year. So I'm very thankful for those things. One being that I, that I kind of pay attention to a lot of trends and I'm very forward looking. I'm very much a futurist in the way that I approach my clients and business. So for me to be able to see things that are a couple years ahead, um, it has been an insanely valuable thing for me. And I've been able to take that and really just like put it there and say, this is great for learning. Um, there's a lot of things that I didn't think would have went in that direction and, and it's worked really well. And I'm now putting that in my kind of list and saying, okay, I have to account for this in the future because people are behaving a little bit different than I thought they were going to behave. I like that your last slide was, it should have been your best year. Cause for me personally, it was, it was my best year and I, I went through a lot of shit this year, but it was my best year in terms of personal growth, professional growth. Um, you know, since I launched my new business, I've learned more in six months on that than I did in my entire graduate program, uh, than I did in my entire time at General Mills. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'm thankful for knowledge and just being able to move forward in my life professionally and personally, because now I know like tomorrow, if, if my business ended for whatever reason, 
uh, I become a pretty hot commodity for many different businesses if I needed to. Like I, I have enough of a skill set. Um, I know how to navigate certain things. So um, you know, 2020, as shitty as it was for maybe a lot of people, for me it was actually a blessing. Um, so I'm thankful for 2020. I don't want to go as far as saying I'm thankful for COVID because that might sound harsh. Uh, but yeah. I mean, COVID is the only reason that Fit Butters exists today. Honest to God. So um, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have this new business venture. And um, you know, some some of the most fun that I've had in my entire professional life since running the brand. So um, that's obviously one thing that I'm thankful for. And I guess you know, the second thing is like, it, I think we say it every year, like friends and family, you know, as it's just like, but true friends. And I think this year I really, I really found out more in my personal circle got a lot, it got a lot smaller. It shrunk a lot. And I think for me, because going through some hardships and, and whatever I went through earlier in the year, you kind of, you have those people who stepped up and, and they're highlighted um, friendships and family members that, you know, you, 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 you try to keep people very close to you that, that are like that. And Josh, you obviously being one of them and, and several other people, not, not a ton in this industry, um, but a couple. And it's like you're thankful for those people because it's somebody you can actually turn to. And I know that's not a business thing and that's more of a professional transparency thing. But that and then obviously my fiance, who will, I mean, by the time this podcast drops in a week, she'll be my wife, which is crazy. Um, so, um, you know, that is a, a huge – the most thankful I am is, is for, for those people, my friends and family, uh, especially in this year. Yeah, I'd piggyback off of that a little bit. I think that's the same on my on my side. I mean, I think that not that I've had some of that fracture, but I think this has been able f- for me to know like, you know, where people's you know, kind of thoughts are or where they're at in terms of friendships I mean, because this has made things a lot more difficult than normal. Usually sometimes you, know, you, can, you can meet for dinner or this or you can go and visit them and and those types of things and there's some people that they need to have that kind of like constant talking points or occurrences for them to still be your friend right. um, because that's just maybe that's how they are. And then that really showed you maybe something that something different, you know, those yeah. types of things. But around, you know, kind of the fiance thing, I mean, that was something when um, started the beginning of like COVID, um, me and my girlfriend, the fiance at the time or fiance now, like we made that commentary together. We sat down. I think this was probably one of our more like um, serious conversations about like what we were about to go through. Um, and we had to look each other in the eye and, and kind of like, okay, we're ready to go to battle together. Like, are you, are we both ready for this? And we, you know, accepted that. And then as the kind of the time went through 2020, we both have been a super appreciative of just the way that both of us have kind of like stepped up for each other in certain yeah. ways at certain times or whatever. And I think that that's super thankful to see like battle testing relationships, I think are super important because if you go in there with this like honeymoon mentality and then you get you know married or whatever, and then you, you hit some type of resistance later on, you didn't know how you were going to react to it. So it ends up creating a lot more of an issue where like, if you had it a little bit before, it helps you when you get to that next experience because you go, all right, we could pull from some experience before. This is how we have been. Maybe we can make a few corrections and move forward. So I, I think that's super, you know, important and, and thankful in that in that sense. And then just as a final one for me, you know, it's just very simple, but being able to actually wake up each day and being inspired to um, work, work hard and, and know that there's some purpose behind what I'm doing and, and I'm helping people and, and, you know, things like that and making small little impacts here and there has been, you know, rewarding enough to keep going and keep going, even when things were you know, super tough or scary or, or whatever it is because of the situation around you, uncertainty around you, you had to find something like dig deep to keep that going each day and each day and each day. And, and, I'm just excited or, or happy or thankful that I was able to wake up each day um, and, and have that fire in my belly to keep going because I know a lot of people unfortunately didn't have to have that and, and they, they struggle with that. And I know that um, it's tough, but I think there's, a, you know, if they can find that and think about it in a positive way, I mean, I think that's what keeps people going, especially entrepreneurs, it keeps them going because there's not those like check in and check out type of a clock in clock out situations. Like you have to keep showing up even when you don't want to. And and sometimes it's tough to motivate yourself day in and day out, like a year like this where you needed to show up each day. It wasn't like you could take a day off or a couple of days off. You needed to show up. So I'm just thankful that I was able to actually just keep that fire going throughout the year. 
Yeah, hundred um, percent. I mean, and you're going to have to keep it going for a bit longer, you know, yeah. obviously with, with the uncertainty of everything going on. So uh, maybe a little bit more transparent than we've been here on the podcast. Loved it though. Hit that subscribe button. If you liked it and write us a review helps out the algorithm, whether it's on iTunes, Spotify, check us out on Facebook. We're at two guys, one shaker cup also on um, Instagram as well at Jay Shaw consulting at fitness informant, Josh, I hope you guys, uh, I mean, I know it's you and your, your girl for Thanksgiving, um, but you guys can obviously use zoom to check in back home in Ohio Say say hola to the rentals. Are they still in Ohio? Uh, one is one is in Florida. So got got some different the, looks out there. The one in Florida is the smart one. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we appreciate you.